Ko reke o hufanga ki he mahi faketapu. Faketapu ki o tua i he langi. Faketapu ki papa tua nuku i lalo. Faketapu ki he tangata whonua ngā tipātua o rākei. Faketapu ki kingi tu heitia mō ngā āriki o te motu. Kia hauaiki mō haa mātā pūle. Whakatapu kia kau whai whekau and other keepers of the wairua. Whakatapu ki mō tōlu kātoa. Tālofa lava, mā loe lelei, Lisa Bulivinaka, tāloha ni, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora, hui hui mai anō tātou kātoa. I thought I would open with a poem. <laughs> Wasn't expecting um, Moka to open with a poem. We have all travelled through the bodies of many relatives to be here today in this place, time and space. All of us wearing those who have passed fresh on our faces. In this new land, can we find our way back to where we once belonged in order to find our way forward? We are the next waves of a tide that has been coming for a long time. This vein leads back to my bones. Every bend, every limb, every bone, the shape of my fingers, the faces of your children, a reminder of all the bodies that have been the making of us, all of our ancestors in the room. Let us activate them. Let them guide us today. This is a knowing from those of us who learned about our place in nature, living at the mercy of the largest ocean in the world. It shaped all of our knowing. It was never on our own terms. It taught us humility about our place in the family of things. We do not consider ourselves masters of the universe. We are ecocentric, not egocentric. And we who learned about our relationships from the smallest islands in the world that taught us to value the quality of our interconnections, sustainable relationships, we call it the va, the quality of our interconnections. Let us make them beautiful, reciprocal, mutual, sustainable, balanced. And then let us follow the ocean roads that led us to the expansion of ourselves and landed us here. Let us navigate through those dark nights and steer through the storms because our leaders have always been determined on the high seas. Let us navigate today connected to what truly matters. And in the recurring darkness, let us dare to shine and have no fear about burning too brightly and resist the dumbing and dimming down of low expectations. Resist those things we fear, but most importantly, resist those people who fear us when we are at our most powerful. Cloaking ourselves in clouds of despair, fear and shame serves none of us. It does not serve our children, it does not serve our communities, it does not serve our country, and it does not serve the world. So let us each find that place where we have the most to give, where we will be of most service, 
and let us heed the words of our ancestors. For the mato, the hook in your hands, are made from the jawbones of our grandparents. As you cast it in this lifetime, ask yourself what they want you to catch. And the same jawbone, your jawbone, will be the hook that your mokopuna use to cast what they want in their lifetimes. And I guess what I'm saying um, today to all of us, in case I lose you after this poem, which is very, very likely, this is Manawana. And you are the threads between what has been before and what will come as long as you have breath. We have so much to remember, we have so much to learn, and we have so much to teach. This kahor is going to mess with this microphone the whole time, <laughs> which I think is going to be a problem for you and annoying. I hope not. Mana moana. I could lose you now because I'm going to talk really, really fast to get through what I can, um, but growing up here in Aotearoa, I learned what mana whenua was, and that is a level of responsibility for kaitiaki and for taking care and hosting, and we've been hosted so beautifully by Ngāti Whātua Rake. When you think, expand um, the idea of mana whenua to mana moana, this is the ocean that connects us all and it has shaped all of our cultures and what is our responsibility as kaitiaki of that ocean and our sea of islands when we are indigenous to this region collectively. And what does that mean? And what is our contribution to the Commonwealth knowledge of the world, I suppose? I think we have a lot to offer. Um, I am going to talk about some ancient things, and I may get them wrong. So if I make a mistake today on the shore, let me rectify it in the deep ocean. And if there is a negative intent, let it fall to shore. I'm just going to start with these boots, OK? So this is my second pair of these boots, because my cousin, who's a pea addict and who is living with us for quite a long time, stole my other pair of boots. And I, had, I loved them so much, I had to go back to the shop and buy a new pair. And so in lots of ways, I want to dedicate this talk to her, because I'm talking about all this high and mighty. But really, um, thank you for the song. That just I want to keep this real. Um, and I was thinking, what is the koha that I can give to an addiction sector talk? And for me, it's about entanglement. So I'm going to try and keep coming back to entanglement, and I hope I make it with the time that I have. So because what I'm going to talk to you about is based on five years of postdoctoral research, and so I'm going to try, uh, first I have to acknowledge the people that guided me because I did not do this research on my own. I was funded to do it on my own. <laughs> That's not really how it works. So just um, ngā mihi nui to the people who guided this and um, in many, many different ways. Um, to the people I partnered with. So this is Dr Evangeline Daniela. She's um, Cook Island's clinical psychologist who operationalist, I call her, in charge of Moana Ops. So I had all these ideas, I had no idea if they'd actually work, and she just went into her forensic, um, she works in the Hawke's Bay, um, took it into the prisons, took it into her private practice, and, um, and helped me ground it in real life. And Dr Johnson Wutihira, who is actually also Ngāti Hamoa, but I never see it in the brackets after his name, um, who helped develop the images for um, Mana Moana. Okay, and yeah, our collective research team, Mana as well. So I'm going to skip this. I talked to a lot of people because you get scared when you're doing mahi like this. The topic of my postdoc was what is healing in a Pacific mental health context. And we don't talk about healing enough in our sector, and it was really lovely to hear you say that word over and over and over again. Sometimes recovery, right? Even that's new for us, like what, what we got to recovery, but hardly healing. 
lots of people that I talk to, but ultimately I just want to acknowledge the 400 knowledge holders, the 4,000 knowledge holders, the 400,000 knowledge holders that have passed our language, our proverbs and our narratives to us today. And so this is a bit of a journey of reclamation. Um, this is my dad. I, um, he's Tongan. He is an overstayer, actually. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I went to school in Tonga and I worked there as an adult and so I sort of had some first-hand experience of my um, homeland and very lucky to do that. Um, he married kind of what looks like a Pākehā, actually she is, to be honest, but she also has um, Whakapapa to Samoa, so this is my, um, my grandmother who passed and that's her mother in the top photo, it's very pixelated, my great-grandmother and my great-great-grandmother, and they're in Saleola. Um, and we whakapapa to the Stowers um, and the Keys and the Kings. And um, I'm from Kolofa'o, by the way, and, uh, for the Tongans that are nosy about that. And um, also Ofu, my grandmother's from Ofu. And someone else um, passed in my life very recently who changed the course of my life. Um, he was my te reo Māori teacher, and he, you could, this is my son who is now two, so he's still a really big part of my life, and he, he opened up a whole other world view for me, um, and it made me think, I, I guess I grew up in the indigenous renaissance, that's how I would describe it. That's my son, like about three weeks ago, um, at the march to Jacinda's office. <laughs> I'm a poet, and I'm going to read the poem that a holograph of me read in Wellington today. It will be the first time I've done it in the flesh um, because it was done like that, which is a little bit foo, right? Um, <laughs> one of my mates is like on Facebook is like, even Beyonce hasn't been a hologram. <laughs> like, mmm. <laughs> But um, one of the things that kind of grounds me and actually led this research is that I have lived experience, and not ordinary lived experience, not like I was depressed once, like full on lived experiences that involved um, hearing voices, seeing things, stints, long stints in psychiatric wards, and if I had had my way, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you, but I am. Um, and that's a whole nother keynote, and I've given it before. <laughs> but um, Stuff just made a podcast, and so if you want the like 44 minute version of that story, um, click on that. It's a pretty easy Google. I just want to say the reason why they used this image of the wheelchair and the brain is because I was told by a psychiatrist that you know how they say, oh, it's just like breaking a leg, mental health, just like breaking a leg, which is not true. Um, he was like, you have a very serious illness and you are going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. Think of yourself as a mental health paraplegic. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Right. <laughs> I was on the invalid's benefit at the time, which um, one of my friends was on it too, and she's like, it's the invalid benefit. And when that's just happened to you and you're just... Um, come out and you think no one's ever going to employ me, blah, 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 ever again, being told that you're going to be in a, you're a mental health paraplegic. It's not very helpful. <laughs> okay, so I guess to go back to that, it really meant that I gave a shit about healing. <laughs> and um, when I did my PhD, uh, I had some questions, and one of them was, for those of us who are Pacific growing up here, what is associated with better health outcomes? And I'm just sharing three slides from my PhD. Um, over a thousand Pacific kids. And what we found from doing that number crunching is that if you were proud to be a Samoan, Tongan, it was ethnic specific, it was statistically significantly associated with being half as likely to report a suicide attempt. And those Pacific participants who felt accepted by their own ethnic group, by other Tongans, if you're Tongan, but also by others, 
they were more likely to try hard at school and do well at school, but they were half as likely to report having suicidal thoughts and 70% less likely to have made a suicide attempt in the previous year. So those were the two main things that I got out of my PhD. There goes five years. Um, <laughs> don't do it, I don't recommend them. But um, one of the things that I realized when I then interviewed people that were functioning really well, I was thinking about how do you feel accepted? Do you feel accepted in a Samoan context? Do you feel accepted in a Palangi context? And often it was no, eh? it was a bit of a struggle. And often because like you don't speak the language, you're plastic, blah, blah. And, um, and then all just the casual racism that you get on the other side. But those that were doing really well had both bags of knowledge. And they don't mix, it's not hybrid necessarily. Like there's that bag that my dad wanted me to have. I have a Michael Kors bag, probably not that one, that's probably too expensive, but I grew up like thinking, I'm gonna get an education and I'm gonna carry that bag. But here's this other bag, right, which is full of our indigenous knowledge and our language. And for me, this bag was pretty empty and same goes for most of the people I interviewed, eh? And so how do we fill this kite and why is it so empty? And this is a kato, a Tongan kato from the Captain Cook collection, boo. Um, and, <laughs> and we don't even make them anymore. So it's not even like what's in there, it's like extinct. Yeah, just saying. <laughs> and John Pule said it beautifully. He says a lot of things beautifully when he said, I inherited the same story of imperial treachery, loss of language and culture, destiny and confidence, and the extermination of dreams. So I was like, how do we put some stuff in that other bag? Because um, that's my bag. <laughs> and that meant going into Oceania's library and the knowledge that we possess and the ki o te moana, the richness and bounty of that knowledge. Gregory Kahite, I'm quoting him as well, like he rocks the Casper. Um, this stimulates the thinking of a people submerged in a culture of silence to emerge as conscious makers of their own culture, to learn about themselves through themselves, right? And the way that he did that was word by word. Um, and for like a plastic half-caste girl from Palmerston North, word by word is like quite handy, right? It's simple. But what he said is you've got to identify the power words of culture, the ones that hold intrinsic meaning to a people. And because I'd been a Pacific Health bureaucrat at the Health Research Council of New Zealand, um, and I just like every other, sorry about it, mocker, non Samoan in the room when they go, kautua, service, this is our model for everyone. And we're like, that's a Samoan word. And I understood how these games got played, right, of exclusivity and just people getting pissed off, actually, that their languages weren't included and marginalised. And so how do we do something for all Pacific kids that doesn't, exclude anyone, and so this here is a family tree or whakapapa of our languages, and when you get to kind of here, we all have the same words, because we're going back to source culture. And so here are some words to do with the moana, and some of you will recognize some of them, and that's how many languages all those words are in. And then what this model says is to find the proverbs, the whakatauki, that go with those words. So Tongan, Samoan, Māori, Cook Islands Māori, Hawaiian, there's some others just lost to me at the moment. Those proverbs that map on to all of these words. So I have a book about this thick of the words, the proverbs, the translations from Edward Tregear. And when you start looking at these words, like tahi, for example, um, or tai, tides, 
anu tahi, when you're soaked deep in sea and overwhelmed by problems. I could already see the way that these could be used in a therapeutic context. Um, because they're magic, right? They're the things that people have figured out. It's worth passing this down. It's worth passing this down over century, over century, over century. Um, so you don't, uh, you can't knock them. And then the stories, right? And I just thought, for this sector, this particular story, faka ita fai gitahi. It's a um, Tongan proverb, and it's take your anger out on the ocean. The story is that there were these brothers, right, and they were, they were harvesting yam, they'd all been working on it, um, and they prepared a big feast as they um, divvied out what every brother got. And the, the, the story is they, they were divvying out, like, they were eating yams and rat. So this is like a real old story. And um, when the youngest brother saw what his older brothers deemed him worthy of having, he was so upset and he was so angry because it was so small, right? And he, he was just so filled with rage and injustice and anger and upset that he just threw himself off a cliff. Whakaita um, faigitahi, take your anger out on the ocean. Very Tongan story, he had a whole lot of Samoan attendants <laughs> and they threw themselves off as well, right? <laughs> it's kind of how we roll, sorry about it. And they all had pia, pia um, tatau. And um, when they hit the water, they transformed into porpoises. And that is the story of how porpoises came to be. And you can see the patterns which are from that pia. The reason why I tell this story is because ultimately we've been, we've had impulse control and self-harm and self-sabotage and suicide stories that go back to the time of the porpoise. And these can be powerful things. We can talk about these without, like, in a way that's safe for people to opt in or opt out. For no, um so not just moana, but also whonua, and then all the mo it's a whole ecology, all the mātauranga around all of these different concepts. And so here's another one um, for this idea of when we blossom and bloom and fruit, but that's not how it is all the time, right? And this word mai, which is oceanic, and it means to wither, to fade, to be in pain, is also part of that cycle and that's something that we've always understood that you're not in full bloom all the time like it's not natural right so just some of these um some of these insights and um because you know how you're like the conferences walk backwards into the future like I, to be frank i never got it i was just like okay <laughs> i don't understand until I saw this. So they recreated the kind of ancient um, Polynesian kind of calendar, and um, it follows the yam cycle. And we didn't have summer, autumn, all of it. We had a wet season and a dry season, and we moved around. And here is Matariki, here is where the turtle lays, here is our harvesting, here is Paololo sperming. Um, spawning here is Matariki, and we went round and round this yam cycle because our whole sustenance and survival depended on it. And when I saw this and thought, oh, time is not in a straight line, gotcha. <laughs> we have been round and round and round, and that's why you go back into your past in order to understand your future, because we have a whole other way of understanding time-space. And I would like to read you um, a poem about Matariki that was that hologram thing. It's kind of embarrassing. Okay, but I thought it'd be nice to put some poems in, right? Right? Yeah, okay. I might, five minutes. If I do this poem, I might not get to entanglement. I'll try and fit it in. Matariki, a call to kainga. Kainga, ainga, aina. Let the morning mist remind us with its cold, fresh breath that we are alive. Mataliki, Matariki, Makali'i, Mataiki. 
marked by constellation high in sky, barely visible to human eye, but known to collectives of seekers searching for signs, lashing ancient markers of time. Can we return to rhythm? Remember lives lived along the arc of a wiser calendar, when we were allowed to wax and wane with life itself. Matariki, can we stop our fossil fueled forever forward, full speed towards an irreversible end? Can we take stock? One million species endangered, the ruin of rivers, fallen forests, the mind, the fract, a carbon choked sky holding his breath for us. We are a water world, an ocean we ask too much of you, gagged, plastic bagged, you hold too much heat on our behalf. Vast dead zones, oxygen deprived, acidic tides, missing and murdered beneath your waves, coral reef graves point their bleached, broken fingers at us. No tomorrow is where we find ourselves today. Heads or tails, if ever the world needed to come full circle, it is now. Matariki, time to honour different ways of seeing the same night sky, different ways of being human and being alive. So let lost languages give us eyes so we may see ears so we may hear, hearts so we can translate the thudding rhythm of the co-created, that which feeds us, breathes us, the substance under our feet, fresh water that flows in our veins, air in our lungs, stardust in our bones, and let us call on our family of relatives to help us heal bright light of the stars, fierce power of the stones, enduring knowing of the tides, the cleansing of water that can still heal everything it touches. Let us attune beyond sound to that which is most profound, the moli, modi, the essence so we can stand in sacred places that have plans for us, encoded into the soul of its soil, build the malai, the marae, to house a future we can live in. And let us not just build meeting houses, let us be meeting houses. Let us host the meetings that need to happen so that we have a future we can thrive in. For we are out of time. Matariki, matariki, makali'i, mataiki. Time to stop, take stock. Pause and reflect on all we've lost to remember our dead, to shed. End the aching arc of a bitter farewell and find fresh. Enter a new cycle following hard-earned, hard-learned bends of where we have been before. Awaken, act, and hope for another turning turn. Um. These are um, some of Johnson's images that capture the kupu that we look at. Um, and so the framework is <laughs> power words, images, proverbs, narratives. There he is. He designed so that earth, sea, sky, atua, whenua, kainga, va. He, he researched these so carefully. And I mean, I've got, I just um, got the people one on my, on my hand the other day, which is a lapita pattern that connects us all. These are the concepts that you really see what a girly swat I am. Um, Austronesian, 37 languages, Oceanic, Polynesian, you name it. That's too much to absorb, so the program that Evangeline developed was an exploration of an island. I, I'm feeling really scared. 
that we're not going to get to um, get to entanglement. But I guess maybe the issue is this, right? Like, how do we keep on being ourselves in a world that is doing everything it can to change us? Especially when we have brilliant, genius ideas about healing and um, these... Uh, just give you some idea. Um, and I think, actually, I might be out of time. So, no entanglement? Go. I go entanglement. Okay, all right. Entangle you. <laughs> Sorry. Right. <laughs> He's so inappropriate, say. So I just laughed at it the whole way through. I love it. I am also quite similar. Okay, so, Va. This is... Um, this is... This is where science catches up with us. The spaces between us are not empty. Eh? They are not empty. They are filled with energy and particles, and some of my cells are probably touching you. You know, like, this is actually how it rolls. Like, it's not empty space. It's the space that relates. And when you understand that our universe is genealogically constructed, right, and we're all part of a family of things, and that's all of our stories, and that is scientifically accurate. But So Richard Dawkins, the evolutionary biologist, says, the lettuce is our distant cousin. Right, it actually is. And um, But they're not stories we live by. Like, what if we did reorient to this idea that we're all family? And then our way of understanding is that that lettuce came first, that makes that tuakana, like elder sibling, and I'm Tana, I'm younger, so that's the way we relate to one another. Um, it changes, um, but when you're thinking about this huge system of whānau, of family, what we're preoccupied with is not ourselves biologically, but the spaces between everything, because that's the space of relating. If we take care of the spaces, the relationships, then the whole thing is in harmony. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, and right here was where I was going to read you a poem about the Samoan cosmogony, which is actually completely aligned with the Big Bang. And I tell you, we have known this for centuries, but we were sa our knowledge was savaged. And um, yeah, it's just it's it's such an interesting thing. Maui Solomon once said at a meeting I was at, the zenith of science is when it meets our indigenous knowledge in what we've known forever. So science is here, and we are here, and that's the zenith. Um, so if we to think about these spaces, right, in the va, this um, Tongan woman said that health, in a Tongan context, is freedom from bad feelings held by others, like towards me, and freedom from bad feelings towards others. So you're thinking about that bar, that space. And others include those of this world and those not of this world, right? So it's always multidimensional. And then you think about your lived intentionality as well as, um, so what goes from you, what flows from you, and because Mason Jury is a genius, centrifugal movement, right? I love that he uses that, that word. And then there's also what I'm on the receiving end of, across that va, my, which he described as um, centripetal movement, right? The flow of what you're receiving. And then, um, so we're trying to focus in on what atu, what comes, what comes from you into shared spaces. So atu or aku is in all of our languages. And when you take te reo, it goes, this translates as from the speaker. It's just not what's happening. It's the energy that is coming. And then my, what you're on the receiving end, and we cared about this stuff, and that's why we mark it in our sentences, right? So atu and my, and then atamai, the double spiral. So um, Okusi Mahina says apa is like a mirror, the um, reflection of my, what is coming towards you. You process it, it goes out. If you have got yucky stuff in there, um, what comes out is affected by that. So it's kind of, I think we knew what CBT was about before it um, got invented. Just saying, the idea of this is that, like, so at the heart of it is aroha atu, aroha mai. Aroha atu, aroha mai. When we say goodbye, we say ofa atu. You know, love flowing outwards, love flowing inwards. 
Arofa in 43 of our languages. But it's not just interpersonal, it's with the whenua, it's with the atua. And she says our mental and physical well-being is affected when these relationships, the va, are not what they should be through ignorance or blatant disregard. So then that flow gets blocked, right? It gets blocked um, with trauma, with sadness, with hate, with guilt. So often with ma, I think we have a ma epidemic in this country. Just watch my kids shaming others, mocking them. Ma, I would um, love for us to better understand how that's operating um, in our country right now, that you're not lovable, you don't belong, you're not good enough for love, that painful feeling, right? So what the traditional healing logic that I researched for a very long time seemed to say is that what sits under these bad feelings is some kind of breach, right? You could call it a sala or a hara, and I distinguish that as something dumb that you have done, <laughs> um, some negative intentionality towards others that um, is under those bad feelings, and it might not be you, it might have happened before you were born, or mala, the receiving of something yuck, right? And um, mala means, they use the word curse as a translation, very unhelpful, mental health services don't like that, um, but just think of it as a negative intentionality, and by the time mala comes to Eastern Polynesian and to Aotearoa, it means to be chipped, and I like that idea of a tree that has been chipped and chopped. That's kind of what it's like to be on the receiving end of that. When one of those are at play, we become bound to one another. It's tension, reaction, we are not free. And the Hawaiians are like written a lot about this state, right? Of, and we were obsessed with atonement once. We fix these things, but now what happens is we get into entanglements. When they're not made right, we get into entanglements. Entanglements, people are born into entanglement. And I guess I felt like with these boots on today, this is what I wanted to give to the um, addiction sector. This idea of being entangled spiritually, with um, whenua maybe, socially, within our family and internally, and it can impact on blameless others. We use the kupenga, the, um, the net, as an example of, of this. And then therefore what is required is a wete or a vete vete, an untangling process. Vete vete in Tonga not only means untangling, it means forgiving. Just saying, because we're geniuses. Um, and <laughs> but um, yeah. Usually we start with the, the atua or the wairua entanglement first, and then it's like, is it with whenua? Is it with tupuna? Is it maybe with people? So it's a kind of, it's an interesting way of thinking about it. But it's unloosening, untying, but you need to identify that original breach, right? And that requires some pretty deep diving uku, in the olden days, we would use taula, which are matakite, um, anchors who could anchor in the other word and cut straight to what that issue was, because sometimes it happened centuries ago. Um, this is from a Methodist missionary who went to Tonga and said, how do they restore health? Well, they would use a taula. They would identify the breach. The gods would know. An investigation would take place. The painful things were brought to light. Sins confess pardon by those who against whom be committed. This wasn't just mental health, this was all health. This is how we understood it. And this is some Cook Islands data to know that I'm not Tongan centric, but really I am a little bit, and some Samoan stuff. Um, but mixing of fishermen um, who cut straight through entanglements, I kind of think that that's who you guys are. I kind of think that's probably a lot of your work. The quest ukumwana is not for the faint hearted. What you're looking for is that precious lay, the whale's tooth in the mouth of the tanifa that you either gift to someone or gift to yourself. You mata, you front it, you follow, you sit down on the mat. Kanohi ki te kanohi, you need to, you always need to. Um, you humble yourself, lalo. You have to go to the truthful guts, the ngaakau. You find what is tonu, what is tika, what is pono. You engage in utu, you make it right. 
you tangi, you cry with, you find misi, mihi, forgiveness, because it's vital in regaining health and it provides a meaning for as much freedom as possible from bad feelings from others and by those harboured by yourself. And then the whole system, oh, I could just end here. It is, um, I unbind you from the fault and thus may I be unbound from it. It's one of the most profound proverbs from Hawaii. Then we get to noa, right, from a state of tapu. Then we have restored harmony. Then we have langi marie, rangi marie, and we can leave our entanglements behind. I um, am, in the, I would never get in the way of your food, and I probably have already. So um, that's a very dangerous thing where I come from. Thank you so much, Emma.